well here. It looks like it's a, an enthusiastic crowd. Oh, yeah. Clapping even before I say anything. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so the new format, like we started uh, last month, is a topic, and today's topic is sleep disorders. And then we'll take questions uh, after 20 minutes to <coughs> a half hour talking about sleep disorders, having a review of sleep disorders as it relates to Parkinson's disease and Parkinson-related syndromes, because sleep disorders are common in Parkinson's disease, but some kinds of sleep disorders are even more common in the Parkinson plus syndromes. So I always ask the question, and I started asking this when I learned that discovery of REM sleep, which is a part of normal sleep during which we dream. And that REM sleep, REM stands for rapid eye movements. And there were studies of individuals, I'm going to talk about what sleep is in general, and how we learned about sleep, and how sleep can go wrong, and result in serious problems leading up to death, actually. There are some disorders of sleep are fatal. There is a rare disorder called fatal familial insomnia. It's hard to believe that inability to sleep will lead to death within 18 months. So it's something I'll talk about briefly because again, that was first discovered at the University of Chicago, as was REM sleep. Where the reason I say this with great pride is that's where I went to college, graduate school, medical school, neurology training. So they had a big interest in sleep dating from 1950s. So in 1950s, they were doing studies of sleep where they bring patients in who were having problems with sleep and they wired them up. So the first set of wires are just like a cap full of electrodes that would measure brainwave activity, known as EEG, electroencephalography. And it's a very, very important aspect of studying a sleep disorder because when you're awake, your brain patterns of electrical activity are very fast and uh, fast frequency, in other words. If you look at it on, on a chart, it's very small amplitude and very fast frequency. As one sleeps, the waves get slower and slower. So if one closes, uh, uh, if one is asked to close the eye, someone has all these electrodes and they're amplifying all these scalp signals that reflect the sum total of cortical brain electrical activity. Very fast frequency uh, throughout the whole brain, throughout the surface of the brain. When one falls asleep, there's a gradual slowing of the frequency. So it gets, you know, there's a frequency called the alpha rhythm from eight to 12 cycles per second. There you see waves going like this, and you can start discerning a slowing of the rhythm. And you notice it mostly in the occipital lobes, towards the back of the brain. So if you close your eyes and get into a meditative state, just relax, you can enter the alpha rhythm. In fact, there are many EEG feedback systems that allow you to get into a relaxed state where you get feedback. When you're in alpha rhythm, you hear a certain tone, and then you learn to get your mind into that place. And, and it's a device that is actually researching and popularity. It's just a little like things you wear that measure EEG, and you can use it to guide your, your, your relaxation. So it's a behavioral feedback, but the behavior is the brainwave activity. I'm telling you this so you get a better feeling of how important brainwave activity is in the study of sleep. So gradually, that as one gets drowsier and drowsier, there are two phases of sleep. Many people who study sleep because they study all these different changes in brainwave activities through, across the surface of the brain. They call it the sleep architecture, the structure of sleep as determined by patterns of brainwave activity that can be measured when you're in a, a setting that allows it to happen. And to do this, you have to really be in a sleep lab. And most, throughout the country, there are uh, studies of sleep studies that are done all the time, because sleep turns out to be a very common problem, insomnia. Uh, so the next phase 
Phase one and two is slow wave sleep. Phase three and four is really slow wave sleep. When you get to phases three and four, you're, you're getting about one or to three cycles per second. So from really fast activity where it's hard to, you know, it's, it's hard to see how, what the frequency is, it's extremely fast when you're awake because there's all this stuff going on. As you meditate, it gets slower in the occipital lobes. And as you get into deeper and deeper sleep, it slows down so much, it's about two to three cycles per second. And this takes about 90 minutes to get into deep sleep, let's say in an hour, and then it gradually gets faster again. Every 90 minutes, you get to slow wave sleep, slow wave sleep, then it starts getting faster and faster. And once it gets to what looks like a waking EEG, very fast, this strange phenomenon happens where the eyes start fluttering back and forth but there's total paralysis of all the other muscles. And this happens only for a mi few minutes. That's called REM sleep. So there's REM sleep and non-REM sleep. REM sleep is rapid eye movement sleep. The difference that makes it very unique with REM sleep, it looks like a person's awake, but they're not. And they're paralyzed and their eyes are fluttering. If you wake someone then, this was what was discovered at the University of Chicago, they'll tell you in florid detail the dreams that they're having. The reason is, it's, their minds are very, very active at that time. They're very, very aware of all this cortical activity, and it's very real. The dream seems very, very real because that's what you're doing. You're processing things like you're awake. The difference is that you can't move to validate what you're seeing. <coughs> and hearing and thinking. Normally how you can tell something's real versus a dream is that if you see something, I see this, this is real. But if I was dreaming this, there's no way I can validate because I'm paralyzed. <coughs> the reason I point this out is certainly we talk about hallucinations that happen in Parkinson's disease. It's very much like REM behavior sleep. Now, here's, here's the thing and then don't wake up. Some people may wake up and then they fall back asleep and the cycle repeats every 90 minutes. So in a really good night's sleep, you go through all the stages of sleep, slower and slower, brainwave activity, gets faster and faster. You become tonically paralyzed for a few minutes and then you come back down again. Usually after the second, after 90, maybe two to three cycles and you're really refreshed. And that's what good sleep uh, architecture looks like. Now what happens in REM behavior sleep disorder? This is the mo one of the most common ones that affects Parkinson's disease. About 15% of Parkinson's disease patients have a REM behavior sleep disorder. About 75% of people with multiple system atrophy, which is Parkinson plus, 75% of them have a REM behavior sleep disorder. And about 85% of dementia with Lewy bodies which is uh, Parkinsonism plus dementia plus vivid visual hallucinations. They have, 85% of them have a marked REM behavior sleep disorder. And what is that characterized by? The simplest way to describe it is, it's sleep in which there's no tonic paralysis of the muscles. So when one's dreaming, arms are kicking and flying, you may be acting out your dream, you may speak out, you may actually walk around, but you're still in a dream state, rapid eye movement state, where you're not really conscious and you're perceiving all kinds of things and you can kick and move and sometimes lash out at your bedmates and they have to go to another room, otherwise they get mutilated or beat up. And that's very, and, and, and that lack of tonic inhibition of muscles, um, results in periodic limb movements, legs kicking out, arms kicking out, during that phase. And so people don't have normal REM sleep. And that ends up, um, how can I say, uh, compromising the quality of sleep. One doesn't have refreshing sleep unless one goes through all the phases in the right sequence. Um, sometimes you'll have the REM sleep occur much earlier than the 90 minutes when it should occur. So a person may not even be asleep, they're sitting down and they start seeing things that aren't there. So visual hallucination is almost like a REM 
uh, phenomenon while one is not really, hadn't, hasn't even gone through the stages of sleep. So those would be daytime hallucinations. There's a lot in common between visual hallucinations that occur in Parkinson's disease, which occur in 25% of patients. Visual hallucinations. And it's not dependent on the amount of drug you take. And probably it's related to the REM behavior sleep disorder. The problem is most people don't have sleep studies. It's very time consuming. You have to spend a day or two in the hospital. You come in, you sleep, they wire you up. It's really hard to sleep. You imagine if it's hard to sleep at home, how much more difficult it is to sleep in, a, in an ambience like that. Although some of the sleep labs that I, I visited, they look like a hotel. It's like a hotel room. They try to make it as comfortable as possible. They wire you up in a, in a, in a way as comfortable as possible. It's not just the brain waves they look at. They look at, they put electrodes above and below your eyes so they can see when you're having the rapid eye movements. They measure the, your, your oxygen saturation because what happens in some sleep disorders called sleep apnea, which is not the same thing as REM behavior sleep disorder. It's a very common sleep disorder called sleep apnea where there's a failure of inspiratory effort. So you might, and there's central sleep apnea and obstructive sleep apnea. And in those situations, this isn't any more common in Parkinson's disease than the general population. REM behavior sleep disorder is more common in Parkinson's disease, but sleep apnea is very common in obese people. Um, there's a very floppy palate, so when they sleep, there's an obstruction, and they don't get air, so they'll have a long period of time where there's no, no inspiration, and the bedmate will notice God, they haven't breathed for about a minute. And they get very, very frightened. Then they'll suddenly wake up because of the apnea. Apnea means lack of, of, of voluntary, uh, it's really an involuntary thing. It's it, lack of inspiratory effort. But if there's uh, lesions in the brain, and it can do for, for a number of reasons. You can see it in MS, multiple sclerosis. You can see it in following brain trauma, following strokes. There, uh, and sometimes it's uh, genetically determined. There's a failure of inspiratory effort during sleep, and people just don't get oxygen exchange, and they, their, their blood desaturates, and it can be cause damage to the brain if you have recurrent episodes of sleep apnea. But what happens when you have these disturbances of sleep? What happens during the day? You start, well, you have multiple naps. You fall asleep, you wake up, you fall asleep. So you don't get restful sleep. I just mentioned two of the, of the common uh, sleep disorders. And then daytime somnolence and multiple naps. And you never feel rested. You always feel tired. Um, in the case of sleep apnea, if one is obese, you put them on a weight loss regimen, or there's some surgeries they do to tighten the palate. It's a surgical procedure, so it doesn't uh, close off the, uh, the trachea, the upper airways. Uh, the other approach is called CPAP, uh, which is a little device you wear that make, under pressure delivers oxygen so that you, you don't ever get completely uh, desaturated. And that helps with sleep a lot. Now they design smaller ones. So they're kind of uncomfortable masks. But REM behavior sleep disorder, um, there's a lot of recent news about it as it relates to Parkinson's. It's considered a prodromal sign of Parkinson's disease. Um, that <coughs> that and the loss of sense of smell are the two most common findings in individuals who are destined to develop Parkinson's disease. So if you already have a, a sleep disorder where you're kicking out at night and yelling in your sleep, but don't have Parkinson's disease, and you're losing your sense of smell, your chances of developing Parkinson's disease in the next few years are very high. Now, it doesn't mean everyone with REM sleep disorder is going to develop Parkinson's disease, but and, and the chances of it being a Parkinson plus is even more likely. Uh, I'm going to talk about treatment in just a moment. The other thing I mentioned at the very beginning was, well, why do we sleep anyway? Well, this diurnal rhythm kind of reflects how we evolved with our universe and with our planet. You know why there's day and night. 
It isn't the sun goes to sleep and wakes up later like we used to think. You know, we actually spin around on the axis of the Earth. Every 24 hours, the Earth goes through one whole rotation. And that's day and night. So when the sun is no longer heating up our planet because of the rotation of the Earth, it gets colder. Um, there's all kinds of thermoregulatory changes. Um, if you are a creature that has really good daytime vision, it's a good time to retire into your cave and keep warm. Um, some animals do just the opposite. The nocturnal animals, the, when the day comes, and of course the vampires, which we all know about, they go into the dark during the day and they come on at night and they're at night. Uh, so rodents are that kind of animal. There's many predator cats um, are very awake during the, the night, but they sleep during your day. What function does it serve? It isn't. This is one of one of my colleagues in Chicago. He's, he's one of the pioneers. He's about 85 now, Dr. Rexhoff, involved in the early studies in Chicago. He's kind of a world authority on the basic processes that drive sleep. I asked him, why, why is it so important to sleep? We all know it is. We know now that sleep is very important for, it's a very active part of our brain activity, just that we don't realize it. All kinds of things that happen during the day are processed and consolidated automatically while you're sleeping. There is a recharging of the batteries is another function, in a sense, giving some rest. Although the brain stays very, very active during sleep. It isn't completely at rest. And there's a lot of oxygen consumption. The brain does all kinds of processing during the night that allows us to function the next day at a, at a more efficient level. But he said, well, we asked the question of why sleep was so important. We wondered, well, what happens if you deprive sleep, animals of sleep? Now, this had come, he did these studies after fatal familial insomnia was discovered. There's only 25 families in the whole world that were, have fatal familial insomnia. About uh, five families are Italian, there's a few from France, a few from Germany. And this is an autosomal dominant disorder. It means if you have this fatal familial insomnia, it passes on in 50% of the kids. But fortunately, it's extremely rare. It leads to death uh, within 18 months of the beginning of the sleep problem. And it begins with problems getting to sleep. Tremendous insomnia. And then it begins to be associated with dementia, paranoia, hallucinations, and finally death. And they've done everything possible to get these people to sleep, including anesthesia-induced coma to get the brain to rest. Well, that didn't prolong their life at all. So there's no solution to familial, familial fatal insomnia. So probably you never heard of that. Very few people know that it exists. But if you try to do this thing in an animal model, by the way, the gene that causes this is very much related to what's called creutzfeldt jakob uh, disorder, which is a prion disease. So this is a prion disease. It's not due to back, it's not really truly, a, how can I say? We know it's inherited, but there's a mutation involving the prion protein. When there are mutations in that prion protein, that's what causes mad cow disease, which causes Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, you've heard of that, and it causes the brain to become like Swiss cheese, a little teeny vacuole, uh, little tiny holes in the brain due to the spread of this prion uh, disorder. Um, there's a bunch of other prion disorders. One is called Kuru. You may have not heard of it, but you can hear of it now. This is a disorder that was discovered in uh, uh, in the South Pacific and these islands like, I think in New Guinea, where there was cannibalism at the time, and there isn't cannibalism now, where when someone in the family died, the brain was consumed by the survivors. And, and if someone happened to have this kuru, which is present with imbalance, ataxia, and a movement disorder, and dementia, if you ate the brains of those people, you would, 20 years later, develop the same disorder. And a person named Gajusek discovered that it was a prion disease. In other words, it wasn't a virus, it wasn't DNA, it wasn't a bacteria. It was just this weird new kind of disorder. That has a lot in common with the disorders that we study now. 
abnormal insoluble proteins accumulate in cells. So this Kuru was another one of these kind of prion disorders, but to have a hereditary prion disorder was quite intriguing. That results in death. So Dr. Rekshoffen said he developed an experiment where he wouldn't let rats go to sleep. So he had rats with, with a surface EEG so he'd know when they're asleep. And they'd be on a uh, turntable system. While they're awake, they're fine. If, they, if their EEG activity shows they're falling asleep, they'd be thrown off the thing. It would be, there would be a device that'd sweep them off the disc into cold water. And they'd wake up and get back onto the disc. And after doing that, for like about a week, these animals um, began to die off on um, a week or a few. I don't know the time frame, but the, they died of what caused their death was fatal hypothermia. And so he believed that the function of sleep is to regulate the thermostat of the hypothalamus, which is the key kind of organizer, master gland of all of our autonomic nervous system. So if that one is messed up because you interfere with that hypothalamic thermostat setting, you're going to die, okay? So luckily none of us have ever been that in some, that much of a problem. So, so REM behavior sleep disorder is very common. Typically, what is done is we can diagnose it without formal uh, sleep studies. Um, basically by the patient and the patient's family, really. It's the patient's family who will notice, or caregiver or spouse that he talks in his sleep a lot. And then he vivid dreams, he yells out, screams in his sleep. Uh, he'll fight imaginary people. He'll be running in his sleep. Uh, and oftentimes doesn't remember anything of what he's going, what's going on. And this can happen at any time, not just, it could happen within half hour of going to bed or, or later on. Secondly, they have multiple awakenings. They don't sleep straight through like a healthy sleep should sleep straight through at least six hours, <coughs> preferably eight to nine hours. But the first symptom of sleep problem in Parkinson's disease, which is well known, even without REM behavior sleep disorder, people have fragmented sleep in Parkinson's disease. And the reason they always say is, well, I have to pee, doctor. For some reason, I just pee a lot more since I've been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. You think it's the drugs that are making me pee more? Or is it my prostate? Well, increased frequency of urination at night is very common in Parkinson's disease. In fact, urination throughout the day and night is more common, and it's not really clear why. But certainly there seems to be more urine production at night. A lot of people think it's because when you lie down, there's the increased perfusion of the kidneys blood perfusion of the kidneys, making more urine at night. But so that's one of the explanations for frequent awakening. People have to get up to pee, but usually if they don't have any other sleep disorder, they don't have a fundamental sleep disorder, they get up and pee and go back to bed and sleep, and they don't feel especially tired. It's people get up to pee and they can't get to sleep right away. Or they, they wake up even without the need to pee frequently. And as a consequence, they have daytime somnolence with frequent napping. So what can mimic this, which is fascinating, is that if you give dopamine agonists like Pramipexol or Requip, some people have they worsening daytime somnolence, especially Pramipexol, and have what are called sleep attacks, where they'll be driving their car, stop at the stoplight, and next thing you know, they're, they fall asleep. So usually, that can be just an effect of the drug, but from what I usually see it as, they must have a sleep disorder as well, because a lot of people take Mirapex and don't have this sleep attack. Um, important thing to distinguish in the, um, when I see my patients say I'm having problems with sleep. Before I'll say that it is REM behavior sleep disorder, which requires that they actually act out their dreams, often they have visual hallucinations, there are some people that the only thing is, I can't get to sleep because my legs feel really uncomfortable and I have to constantly be shifting my weight, shifting around to find a comfortable position. That's called restless leg syndrome. And it's very, very different than the periodic limb movements of REM behavior sleep disorder. 
So when I, someone says, yeah, I can't get to sleep because my legs are moving all the time, the spouse will say that. I have to ask, are you moving the legs because you can't get comfortable? If that's the case, usually it's more likely to occur in people with peripheral neuropathy or have tingling or funny, creepy sensations in their limbs. But it can happen in Parkinson's disease. You sometimes get creepy, funny sensations in their limbs. They can't get comfortable. They shift their weight, click their legs around before they can get to sleep and sometimes have a great difficulty getting to sleep. That's called the restless leg syndrome. And guess what's used to treat it? Low-dose dopamine agonists work very, very well. And sometimes I'll use cinnamon before that time for people who feel they can't get to sleep because they're too rigid. The legs are so tight. They give them a little bit more of the dopamine agonist before bedtime. How about REM behavior sleep disorder? Does Cinemac work for that? No, in fact, that might cause more hallucinations if you increase nighttime either dope or carbidope. What is recommended in the literature, which doesn't make sense to me, is a low dose benzodiazepine, like clonazepam, 0.5 or 1 milligram. Supposedly, is what you do for REM behavior sleep disorder. The problem I see with it, it works only for a short while because tolerance develops to its effects. So what a lot of people are doing, including myself, is using the same drug I use to treat visual hallucinations. Works dramatically as a sleep aid for Parkinson's disease, especially if there's REM behavior sleep disorder, and that is Seroquel, Ketiapine, which is a novel tranquilizer that tolerance doesn't develop to. It doesn't block dopamine receptors, so people with Parkinson's disease can take it. And Seroquel at very low dose, much lower doses than are used for psychotic disorders. Um, Seroquel was developed to treat schizophrenia without producing Parkinsonism. Because all of the drugs you use to treat schizophrenia and psychosis, the old traditional kind like Haldol and Thorazine, block dopamine receptors in the emotional brain, but they also block dopamine receptors in the motor part of the brain, the nigrostriatal system. So you can't give those major tranquilizers to people with a REM behavior sleep disorder and hallucinations if they're going to, it's going to worsen their rigidity and their Parkinsonism. So the only category left are the novel neuroleptic drugs, which is ketiapine or olanzapine. These drugs are tranquilizing drugs that in high doses are used in young schizophrenics, but in tiny doses are used for visual hallucinations in Parkinson's disease and REM behavior sleep disorder. Even if there isn't even a REM behavior disorder, but just difficulty to get restful sleep, multiple awakenings. Here's the, here's the conundrum that we get with that. So here's a patient, doesn't really have REM behavior sleep disorder, but is extremely fatigued and tired all day, and just doesn't get restful sleep. So I'll try a low dose of Seroquel, and they sleep beautifully. But then they'll say, you know, what I don't like it is I'm too groggy when I get up to pee and I'm afraid I'm going to fall. And I say, well, the idea is to get you, keep you in bed for six straight hours, so you got to start wearing the pants. Or, and if you're a man, a Texas catheter, or you have a bedside commode so you don't have to wander far. And you never know if you have an accident. So that's the, the conundrum. I can improve the sleep, but the patient perhaps doesn't want to have such good sleep because they don't like the idea that they're becoming confident during sleep, and that's perfectly, it's hard to sleep well when you're all wet, right? So, so that's difficult. So I'll use a, a low dose of ketiapine, sufficient to help them sleep, but not so much that they can't get up, go to their bedside mode and pee, and get back into bed without having a major catastrophe like a fall. Um, but the... The thing that's troubling for me is that there really is no good solution to REM behavior sleep disorder. Certainly the clonazepam is unsatisfactory. I'll use it in the beginning for a while, but then after all, it's not effective. Then the Seroquel is a problem because if you really improve the sleep and prevent hallucinations, they will grumble that, you know, I'm too, I feel too groggy the next day or I'm too groggy if I have to get up to pee. So we have to cut back on, on the medicine there. And then now there's a black box warning, which is ironical, that the FDA puts on for these novel neuroleptic drugs, both the one I, that I use all the time, 
that they're overused in nursing homes where there's a lot of demented patients and it increases the risk of death. And they, so I get warnings. Doctor, are you aware of the black box warning? I noticed, you know, this patient, you prescribe Seroquel, patient has dementia, they're at greater risk of dying. So what's, what's the choice there? Just let them continue to hallucinate, be disoriented about reality, or you find a very low dose. And I respond saying, yes, the doses that you might use in a nursing home for controlling bad behavior, violent behavior, is much, much higher than what I use at bedtime. So I use it at nighttime as a sleeping aid, and there's no problem. I've never had anyone die from the use of Seroquel. However, if you read the literature, the ones that might have an increased risk of stroke or death are, have been receiving it round the clock or big doses throughout the day. So just be aware of that. Certainly we don't use the chemical straight jackets, chemical straight jackets that were, that's the name for the original tranquilizers, Thorazine and Haldol, because they block dopamine receptors. And they're often used in a lot of state psychiatric hospitals or nursing homes where there's a lot of demented patients who are confused, disoriented, and sometimes aggressive. Can't use those drugs in those people, those quote chemical straitjackets. But I feel very comfortable in using the novel tranquilizers. And there's only two that, I, that are, meet those criteria that we can use. There's actually three, but the third, the first of them, is not practical to use, called Clausero. That was the first of them. Um, the reason is that you require blood monitoring because it can cause a decreased production of blood cells. The two recent ones, catiapine and olanzapine, are safe to use. They have no negative impact on blood, on the bone marrow, or on any other system. And, and given it the doses we use for nocturnal use, there's really not any danger to their use. The main complaint being it makes them too sleepy, too deep asleep, so they they can't get up to do their thing, too. Um, so that's what, all I'm going to talk about sleep, except for one final thing, and then I'll take questions. There's this concept of sleep hygiene. Um, and one of the important aspects of sleep hygiene relates to the role of melatonin. Now, melatonin is produced by the pineal gland, and it varies as the Earth rotates around its axis. The more light there is, when we're getting the full daylight, there's less melatonin being produced and there's less melatonin circulating in your bloodstream and bathing the brain. When it's night, as it's getting darker and darker, the melatonin levels increase and then melatonin tends to be an important component of inducing sleep. That's why you can get over-the-counter melatonin because some people just don't make enough melatonin. As we age, one of the explanations for poor sleep is that we don't make enough melatonin. So you can supplement with five milligrams of melatonin. And that's also recommended for REM behavior sleep disorder. Melatonin, clonazepam is the first choice. The next choice would be Seroquel. But here's the thing about melatonin and sleep hygiene. As we get older, we have to get up to pee a lot more at night than when you were a child uh, or an adult, a young adult. So since you have to get up at night, you turn on lights at night so you don't fall. So the bright lights, and even watching TV before you go to bedtime, that light shuts down production of melatonin. So what happens is you maybe have melatonin, it's okay because it's been dark, you've been three hours in, you have to get up. And when you get up, you see all the lights are on so you don't fall and injure yourself. And just that two minutes of light will mess up the melatonin rhythm. So that's one thing. So to get the good hygiene, you have to be in the daylight during daytime. So what happens in many of um, senior people's homes is that they put the shades down because the light is too bright, too hot, and they have to turn up, you know, make the air conditioner very strong. So they have the shades down. So day and night, it's always kind of twilight. The important thing for sleep hygiene, let the sun come into your room. Go out into the sun for a while, or at least let the sun reflect on you. You don't have to get direct sun, but just the bright light getting in through the eyes. Shuts down melatonin. And if you're exposed to light throughout the day, your melatonin will be, have been shut down. It's resting, your pineal gland. And as it gets dark, 
Turn off the lights when you're ready to go to bed and don't turn them on again. Now, what if you have to go to the bathroom? You're gonna feel your way around. Well, that's dangerous too. So I don't know the best solution other than to have a bedside commode and have a little flashlight, if anything, a dull little flashlight so at least you know where the bedside commode is. So that, I'm talking, that's sleep hygiene. Brightness in the day, darkness at night. Don't have the twilight zone day and night. That's sleep hygiene. The second part of sleep hygiene is do a daily exercise and don't do it too near bedtime. Do it during the day, maybe even right around supper time, just before supper time. But don't do it evening time. And do it so that you have your heart rate really going up to, uh, basically take a walk, do a, a stationary bicycle, whatever you do for exercise, do it on a regular basis. That also improves the quality of sleep. Um, other things, when you go to sleep, this is gonna sound funny to some people, don't, because I know people who will drink coffee and they say, absolutely no effect on sleep. I sleep fine with an espresso before bedtime. I certainly don't. If I have an espresso at 7 p.m., I notice that my evening is not good. So avoid a lot of chocolate and coffee after supper or anywhere in the evening. Chocolate is a big, you know, because chocolate has got so many good things going for it, but it has enough theobromy that it interferes with sleep. It's just caffeine-like material. Same with tea. If you're going to have tea before bedtime, you have it without getting an herbal tea without uh, theophylline, which is the caffeine equivalent in tea. Um, secondly, don't have alcohol before you go to bed. In fact, just have, if you are using alcohol in a healthy way, which is with meals, having a drink, maybe one drink after a meal, but then wait three hours before you go to bed. Don't drink uh, an alcoholic beverage because that really messes up sleep. A lot of people will drink a ton just to get and hit the pillow and they go to sleep, but then they wake up two hours later and they can't get back to sleep. This is well-known effect of alcohol. So that's all part of good hygiene. What you eat before you go to bed, exercise during the day, bright light in the day, darkness at night. And then if you're still having sleep problems, then we can use medication. So that, that's all I need to say for now, and I'll take questions. It could be about sleep, or it could be about the circus, or you know. <laughs> Go ahead. My question is, what do you depending on prostate? Depending on what? Prostate? My prostate is going to bed. I was up to 10 to 12 times a night. I go back to bed and fall asleep right away. I've been controlling that, getting the down to about two, maybe three medications at once. Which I don't feel any difference in the morning. And I dream a lot. I, crazy dreams. And I can tell you about most of them the next day. Am I getting the right amount of REM sleep? I think if you're dreaming, and you're, it'd be good to see when you're dreaming whether you're kicking and turning. No, I no. So, so you probably do, and, and I think getting up more than three times is too much to really have a good sleep. And what, what you, there are medications that your urologist may prescribe that will inhibit the bladder just enough so you don't have to get up for the first few times. And then by the time the bladder gets really large, you can go. But there's the problem with the enlarged prostate and with women with, uh, and with anybody with Parkinson's disease is that the, the contractile strength of the urinary bladder is diminished. In the case of prostate, there's obstruction, partial obstruction, so the bladder can't empty completely. So you go more frequently. And then in the case of the autonomic nervous system being involved, which happens in a lot of people with PD, there's not enough muscular strength to completely empty the bladder. So the residual urine is why you have to get up so often, because you still have residual urine. But if you can desensitize the bladder a bit to allow the bladder to fill up more before it has the urge to pee, before it starts giving you signals, hey, I get up and pee. Um, so something like Vesicare or Nitropan can be helpful. 
In the case of people with large prostates, it's a delicate issue because if you inhibit the bladder too much, you get a urinary tract infection and, and complete, you know, obstruction. And then that's, that's not good either. So those are delicate balance like so many things. But what you described doesn't sound like you have a REM behavior sleep disorder. It sounds like you have a problem with multiple awakenings because of the bladder waking you up. So. The other part of that question would be use a night light at night where the lights are real dim. But you, as dim them. as possible. Yeah, ideally, it would be good if you had a little red light. <laughs> Just like in the bordellos in Europe, <laughs> you just it, it won't um, alter the, uh, the the melatonin as much, like using a dark room. <coughs> so here. So go ahead. Keep the palate elevated. Yeah. Yeah. So they find that he has an obstructive sleep yeah. apnea. Because that's, you use mechanical devices if it's obstructive. The palate is too floppy, you lie down it. <coughs> then you use those things. But in central, central sleep apnea, those things don't work. Central sleep apnea, the problem is the inspiratory drive. So there are these little circuits, neural circuits that control how inspiration and expiration. And that's uh, uh, something deep in the brain stem. That's why it can be injured in a number of various conditions. And it results in inability to drive inspiration. So you want to take and that's it. And you stop until eventually something kicks in and lets out. But it goes, and if there's a lot of snoring, then it's a palatal thing. Snoring plus long periods of apnea, those would be obstructive sleep apnea. And those can be treated surgically. There's a procedure that they do where they tighten the, the palate or they have orthodontic type devices. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot. She's been waiting. <coughs> oh, you always ask her questions, so it should be good. Okay. Uh, is the uh, colonoscopy toxin to the brain? What is that? It's a colonoscopy, the, uh, the drug. It's a toxin to the brain. Which one are you talking about? Which drug? Maybe I didn't say it right. Clonazepam. No. Clonazepam is the cousin of Valium and Librium. It's called a benzodiazepine. It has muscle relaxant effects, anti-anxiety effects, and in certain doses, hypnagogic, or actually hypnotic effects, sleep-inducing effects. So they've taken some forms of benzodiazepines to help induce sleep. One of them is called Zoldepam, uh, <coughs> Ambien. The one that uh, clonazepam is probably the one I would use the most, not so much for inducing sleep, but because it's tremendous muscle relaxant and also a good anti-anxiety agent. But to be used only for the short term. So if I use clonazepam for REM behavior sleep disorder, it would just be for a short term because eventually it doesn't work for REM behavior sleep disorder. It's way in, over there. Amitriptyline? Yeah, fit into the same thing. And can you spell the two drugs, Seroquel and the other one that you recommend? Thank you. So the, the amitriptyline, it, actually that was a very good question that I, I, I completely forgot to bring up. Because I don't write notes or anything. I like to have everything in my head. But it's a very good question because he asked about the use of an antidepressant that you give at night called amitriptyline. And I, it's a fantastic medication for several reasons, but I'm going to backtrack for the part I skipped over. Depression is also one of the antecedents of Parkinson's disease. In about 70% of Parkinson's cases, there was a diagnosis of depression even before the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And one of the symptoms of depression is a sleep disturbance, either excessive sleepiness, where you not only sleep at night, but you sleep all day too, or insomnia. It could be either way. So one of the things you do 
first before using clonazepam. Not, not for REM behavior sleep disorder, however, but for just, there's a patient that says, I just never get really good sleep, but they don't meet the criteria for REM behavior sleep disorder. Then I'll use a nocturnal antidepressant. The one that I like is amitriptyline or doxepin. Those are two different uh, drugs, but they both have similar mechanisms. So they make you very sleepy, for one thing. And so it, it helps to induce sleep. But after about a month of taking it, the antidepressant effects kick in. So one feels much more energetic in the day and sleeps better. So to the extent that the sleep disorder relates to depression, that's how much better you're going to be on these nocturnal antidepressants. Sometimes giving a daytime antidepressant will also work. And you don't, if they say, I don't have a problem with sleep, getting to sleep, it's just that I wake up very frequently and it's not the peak, then I might try a daytime antidepressant of the class, Prozac class called SSRIs. And that you give them a day, it doesn't make you sleepy. So people wanted to, spelling, you know, it's funny because if I was to spell, you probably won't be able to write it down anyway. But I'll tell you, <laughs> Seroquel is the one I like to use for REM sleep and for visual hallucinations. S-E-R-O-Q-U-E-L. That's the brand name. Everyone should know what the generic name is, but I won't spell it out. It's called Ketiapine. Q-U-E-T-I-A-P-I-N-E. -E. Don't write it down. Just remember Seroquel. Seroquel who? <laughs> anyway, I have mnemonic. So think of Sarah Quell. Sarah Quell. The other one is called Olanzapine or Zyprexa. Z Y P R E X A. That's also used. Well, I'll use that for REM sleep disorder. But most neurologists that you see who aren't experienced with Parkinson's disease may give you clonazepam. C L O N A Z E P A M also known as clonopin. Um, the other, the, the doxepin is the other antidepressant I use at night. There's two others that are really good when there's depression and insomnia in patients with Parkinson's disease. One is mirtazepine, M-I-R-T-A-Z-E-P-I-N-E, -E, known as Remeron, R-E-M-E-R-O-N. <laughs> You asked for it. No, you asked for it. You know, I don't think that's important to you because you're not going to be prescribing it. Are you going to be prescribing it? You should ask your doctor. Don't say, this is what I think you should give me, doc, because that will rub him the wrong way. Can you spell it? Yeah. Can you spell it, doc? Well, I was always good at spelling. But I, I, I was born in Venezuela, but I learned English, so I really liked being the best speller. I won a lot of spelling bees. Um, I, I wasn't finished. There's another antidepressant called doxepin. Well, just because I, I prescribe it a lot. Doxepin is, was an antidepressant, has a lot of similarities with amitriptyline <laughs> for people who are depressed and anxious, because depression has a little sister called anxiety. They often go together. And associated with poor sleep in a patient with Parkinson's disease. And doxepin is a really nice one to give at night because it induces sleep but has, in the long run, antidepressant effects and some anti-anxiety effects. So, uh, I have one more question. Circadian rhythm. Circadian. 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 You mentioned it once, but I... Uh, uh, my memory. Yeah. A circadian rhythm uh, is a... Uh, uh, applies to changes every 24 hours that occur in our brain, uh, in our body. So there are things that change as day and light change. What's the most obvious one is sleep and wakefulness. There's a rhythm to sleep and wakefulness, and that's so it's a circadian rhythm. There are all kinds of systems that pick up sensory information that guide our circadian rhythm. So one of them is the pineal gland which developmentally is like the third eye in the lamprey. If you've ever seen a lamprey eel and you dissect the brain, their pineal gland is real near the surface and it looks and it gets some visual stimuli through the skin. But it doesn't use it to see like the other eyes. Our pineal gland, which the old uh, philosophers thought was the seat of the soul, because it looks kind of like an eye, it's not, and it's deep in the brain 
And it gets a, a branch of the retina from each side that feeds the pineal gland. And depending on the amount of light getting from hitting the retina, the amount of melatonin is changed. So if you have a lot of light coming into this retinal pineal circuit, melatonin is going to decrease. If it gets dark, the eye sends a message to the pineal gland and you start making melatonin. Melatonin is a hormone that's released into the blood from the pineal gland and starts inducing sleep. That's why if you take five milligrams of melatonin just before bedtime, you can induce sleep pretty well. But it won't cover you through the whole night. It's good as a sleep inducer. And some people, that's all you need. By the way, one of the safest, safest sleeping meds in my Parkinson patients who don't have depression, who don't have REM behavior sleep disorder, but they say, I never feel rested during my sleep. I have a hard time getting to sleep. I don't slap on a benzodiazepine right away because that creates problems. I recommend Benadryl, 50 milligrams at bedtime. You can get the Advil PM, which has Motrin plus Benadryl. Those work very, very well. And it has some mild effects that are helpful for tremors at night. Yes, this is the last question. I've heard gerontologists say that geriatrics should not use Benadryl. It causes memory loss. Is there any research about this? Well, the, the, main, the main, that's a very poor study. They just saw an association. They didn't say it caused it. They say that individuals with Alzheimer's disease have a higher likelihood of having used Benadryl for years than individuals without Alzheimer's disease. It's, an, it's one of these epidemiological observations. It might be a clue. And in fact, probably the people who are using the Benadryl are using it because they have insomnia. And, they, and the reason they had insomnia was they were going to develop Alzheimer's disease because insomnia is one of the predictors of Alzheimer's. That's why you have to be careful. It isn't that Benadryl causes dementia. It's that people who are demented are more likely to take Benadryl. And you could justifiably conclude that, especially since the data shows that insomnia <coughs> is a prodrome. It's a bad thing to have because you're either going to get Alzheimer's dementia or a multiple system atrophy dementia plus Parkinsonism. So you have to treat that. One of the best things is exercise in the day, good sleep hygiene, uh, Benadryl, if you need it, it's much safer than taking, say, the Valium-like drugs. And if you're not depressed, you don't need to take the antidepressants to help you sleep. So that's, that's all I'll, I'll answer for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.